Vox and Hops Brutal North America is brought to you by Indie Merch Store. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons. Uh, the first, um, you know, it, it's saturated with hops and hops is uh, the main the main aspect of the hop that, that's going to give the, the the wow factor to a New England IPA is the oils, right? And oils, like any type of oil, it's very sensitive to oxidation. So as soon as you have some oxidation in your product, there's going to be an initial transformation, which might ha- actually help the beer. But then if you go a bit too far and that range is really tight, then you're just going to lose all that explosiveness from the hops, the fruity character and all that. And it's really also going to kind of change the mouthfeel and it's just going to die off real quick. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope you've been having a glorious week. I hope you have been getting stoked and excited for Vox and Hops Brutal North America, which is coming up throughout the week of June 21st to the 25th. What is Vox and Hops Brutal North America? Well, it's all about curated collabs. That's right. I have paired together 22 Vox and Hops alumni with metal breweries across the United States and Canada to create unique collabs for their bands. I'm so excited about this. I'm so stoked that so many people are working together to spread the word of life, metal, and craft beer. I am humbled, excited. I can't wait to see everyone taste these beers and experience them. It's a truly unique thing, and I'm very, very excited about it. If you would like some more more information about Brutal North America, head on over to my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com, and you will be able to find a whole bunch of extra information right there. Before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'm also asking you to rate it and write a review, because when you do that, more people just like yourself will be able to discover the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, why do I say that? It's because when someone's looking for a new podcast to invest their time in what do they do they scroll down they look at those reviews and if those reviews are positive and reflect their values they will most probably give that podcast a chance so if you were to write a review for the vox and hops metal podcast you could actually be the person that sways someone to become a brand new vox and hops head and that would be something that i would truly appreciate now in today's episode i'm with gabriel zulon of brasal zunal boreal Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 272. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Gab Dulon of Brassard's Now Boreal. And I am very, very stoked to be with you because, uh, in my opinion, you are the man that changed everything in the craft beer game here in Quebec. Uh, how are you doing, Gab? Hey, man. Thanks. Uh, pretty good yourself? Very good. Very good. Um, and I, I say that I say that with true depth and, and truth, because uh, if it wasn't for one little beer, who knows where the Quebec craft beer scene would be. And uh, I have had this beer featured on numerous Vox and Hops episodes because uh, when it came out, people just went crazy and then over the years it became available on tap in bars so i would go out and do vox and hops episodes and it gave me so much freedom that this beer was available because it is a true delicious craft beer and i was i was very proud to go into a bar and it was available at foofs so i would go downstairs and get two pints of this beer climb upstairs into the backstage and present this beer to whichever artist i was doing i remember doing it with uh John from Warbringer, and he loved it. And of course, I'm talking about uh, IPs in August. What a killer brew. We're going to talk about this beer later, but it's true. I, with this one beer, you changed everything in Quebec. And uh, I don't know if you realize this, but it's, it, I, I definitely do. So it's <laughs> killer beer. Let's just jump into a more standard format. Enough praise about you. Let's talk about how you coped with 2020. Yeah, so I think 2020 was a big challenge for uh, for everybody. Uh, it was also a challenge for us, especially with the fact that you know bars and restaurants were uh, on and off. And uh, for us, the the on premise accounts are are a big part of the the business. So uh, we had to adjust ourselves, and we uh, one of the, of our main focus was 
try to keep you know our team really motivated through that time and get them uh, across and uh, keep them working and everything. So um, y- you know it was hard. It was challenging. We put together new stuff to keep uh, people motivated. We came out with uh, I think we we came out with more beers in 2020 than any other year before, and we did some collaboration mostly with uh, local suppliers, local artists to really bring that thing together. We had this slogan "Osa uh, Sarli Could." We want to encourage uh, you know local. Uh, local businesses and all that so i think that that was one of the uh, one of our highlights and uh, it brought us today to to work even more than before with those guys so so um although it was a big challenge some good stuff came out of it which is always you know always a win-win situation but uh i think for everybody both on the personal and uh, professional level it was a it was a challenge but uh i think uh, we came out pretty pretty well out of it Hell yeah, hell yeah. And I love that collaborative series, uh, also Sagli Kud with all the, the local, um, you know, from, from malt people, from hop people, the to honey people. It was, it was really, really cool. And the artwork was always very uh, interesting, appealing. Uh, I, I thought it was super cool. And uh, if that's one good thing that came out of 2020, that makes me very happy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your first beer, Gab. Do you remember the very first beer that you drank? The first beer that I drank uh, was probably uh, a beer from Molson or Labatt because I remember at the beginning I did not like beer. Uh, actually, I was more of a uh, rum and coke guy uh, up until I drank my first um, uh, Newcastle. Mm. So SAQ had some Newcastle and I had that beer. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You had the nutty flavor and something really different from a, a you know, beer uh, perspective. And then after that, I fell into McCoslin and Boreal beers. And then that's where I got really interested in with Unibu. I think like a lot of the, uh, the older brewers, I'll go through that kind of process. So starting there and, you know, getting to know the stories and encouraging, you know, uh, breweries that have been uh, on the Quebec scene for a while. I think that's, that's where it started. But the first beer was probably, you know, Molson X or something like that. When my dad was drinking and I remember just thinking like, how can people like this? It was just so, <laughs> so terrible to, to my taste. So yeah, that was probably one of the first beers I've had. How did you end up getting into the crazy world of brewing craft beer? Uh, well, I was always a guy that liked to do like try some new do it yourself stuff. And, um, obviously in, in the, my CJEB days, uh, money was a, a bit, a bit rough and, uh, people were making wine. So I started, oh, let's try to make beer. And uh, I was really more into the science and engineer part of my, uh, where, where I was studying. And, uh, the more I got into that, I started studying in, uh, food chemistry at McGill and brewing more and more. And then everything kind of started to make sense that I'm like, oh, there's the brewing industry. The, the, the process is really, really interesting the product is even better and then when you get to start to to meet up with new breweries and new brewers you realize that it's a completely different uh industry than the others you know people work together people want want the community to to bring out better beers and for me that was really something that was really eye-opening i'm like okay i want to be part of this i want to i want to brew with those guys i want to be part of the scene so uh, I started visiting breweries, started getting a job as a brewer. My first job was actually at Boreal as a night shift brewer when I was uh, at university. And then from there, I, got, I worked at a bunch of other breweries and then came back to Boreal maybe six years ago. Insane, which is just around then that, that this bad boy came into existence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I remember when it came out, it was crazy. The internet was just freaking out. Just totally. What is this beer? It's it's we Vermont is 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 here, uh, you know Vermont Boston. We, it's the closest thing that we can get. We don't have to trade anymore. And initially, it came out in the smaller version cans. And I remember the very first time that I saw someone was at Butinbiar on Liège Street, and I walked in there and I felt like a kid at Christmas. That here it was in the like in the can. It was there, and and I remember buying and taking it home and thinking it was super dope. You know totally different than everything else that was going on in, in this scene. And then flash forward to this year, and then you drop this monster of a beast, <laughs> which is a killer, killer collab with my boys, good friends at Masorum, of course. And who knows if Masorum would be around if this hadn't, you know, they probably would, but yeah, yeah, the impact, so. <laughs> the impact of this beer is, is big on the scene, which is why I want to share this beer with you. Awesome. Because I, it's a killer, killer collab, and Masorum are killing it. And to have one of their products available <laughs> where you don't have to wait in line 
<laughs> was super, super cool. So let's check this. What is this beer? Introduce this beer to everyone, please. Yeah, so this is uh, Tourbillon Palais. So it's our collaboration with uh, Mezarem. So how, how it started, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of collaborations going around. And I think it goes back to what we said before, that it's a really special industry where people want to work together. And that's really cool. But I think what makes a collaboration really special is when there's a story behind it. And um, it was last year we started uh, this collaboration with uh, our friends, uh, Sir John, which are not too far from the brewery. Uh, great guys. And uh, it just started off. I, I went over to their brewery, fell in love with the beer and the food and the, the how everything was. And I just sent them an email. Then we met and then we started brewing a beer. And then the cool thing was to, to allow these guys to have beer available everywhere. Right. And then I'm like, OK, well, that's a cool concept. Let's try to to do that again. So um, how this one started, actually, we, we came up with a beer, was, which was called La Diversion, which was a double oh. IPA. And the label was kind of this camouflage and it, it had this uh, kind of resemblance to uh, uh, Mezarem labels, right? And it kind of struck us once it was out and then, you know, the, you know how the internet is, it just went crazy and we're like, oh my God, okay, that wasn't the intent. We love you guys. So, so I felt super bad. So I, I ended up by getting, um, I knew uh, Vincent Menal from, uh, you know, he was at the uh, Trois um, Thomas Qatar before. So I sent him an email. I'm like, you know, can, can we talk? I just want to, you know, talk about this label. And, I, and then he sends me, oh, it's like uh, the guy that takes care of the, the design is uh, Marc Andre. So, mm -hmm. okay, give me, so I give him a call. And he's like, he's really chill about it. He's like, oh, so don't worry. We, we, we like you guys. And, you know, we don't have a, uh, a trademark on camo. And so we just started laughing. And then I'm like, let's surf on that. And why not brew a beer together? And then, you know, so that's really how it started. So it's just this double IPA, you know, uh, hazy double IPA with Citra Mosaic and Vic Secret. So we uh, worked together the recipe to have a bit of both the uh, signatures of each brewery. And I think that's the thing that's really cool with these New England IPAs. Each brewery is going to have their signature, either through uh, the process that they use or either the yeast or whatever. So we tried to go like, you know, both ways and uh, we're really stoked with, the, with uh, the result. It's cool and people freaking out when this came out. So, so congrats on that. Let's crack it open. Let's, let's yep. taste them. Let's see uh, what's going on with the Tourbillon Polaire. That's a nice glass. Why, thank you. It's a uh, mad juice. You can smell the hops from this far away and you know that's gonna be a good thing. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. See, it's dank, juicy, um, boozy, but with like just a super enjoyable hop burn. Uh, I am not a fan of the super green beers, but this is not that whatsoever. I love it. It's got that round, sweet palate. Delicious, delicious. Um, let's talk about metal. Vox and Hops is all about metal and life and craft beer. Have you ever dabbled with the darkness that is metal? Uh, I'm a big fan of music. I'm a big fan of uh, a lot of different styles. And I think that, that was a, a question I want to ask you because I think when you talk about metal, it could go really wide. I could tell oh, you yeah. that for me, metal, it, it might be... I don't know. I used to be a big fan of like Rise Against at the beginning when their first albums, but is that, you know, punk metal, punk rock? I have no idea what defines really metal. So I, I, I've never been the biggest fan of like, you know, really hard metal, to be honest, but I've been, uh, you know, surfing from, you know, jazz to soul to always been a huge, I think my favorite band is the White Stripes. I have pretty much all their, their vinyls and, you know, there's some of that, but there's, there's a bunch of different stuff. So all that to say that, I've never dabbed into the hard metal stuff, but I've always been a fan of just like, you know, people that are able to express themselves and, you know, try to, to it's always fun to hear something new, right? That, that kind of gets you out of your comfort zone. And uh, yeah. Well, metal will definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, the metal is such a huge scope just as what is beer, especially nowadays. It's such a, a violent conversation pastry stout, smoothie sours, what is a beer? What is a metal band? <laughs> There's, you know, if it's got aggressive guitars, harsh vocals, and with the podcast, I've interviewed everyone from some Sebastian Bach, all the way to George from Cannibal Corpse. You know, there's a, there's a wide array of, of what is metal. So, so that's okay. Uh, take me to the first show that you went to go see. Do you remember the first show that you went to go watch? 
the first show that I went to go watch what was it? I think uh, that's probably not going to make any sense, but I think it was this high school band. Uh, they were playing some covers from I think it was Lincoln Park, and that was like the first you know show, and uh, I think it was probably fourteen or fifteen. Yeah, that so it was me. That might have been me. <laughs> I was in a band and playing covers of Lincoln Park. Oh, yeah, with bleached hair and this, uh, yes, a lot of gel. And you know, it, it was good. That was the music we were listening to. And uh, we we're all skateboarding and just, you know, it fit in the scene. And uh, yeah, it was some pretty good stuff. <laughs> that could have been me, honestly. Bleached hair, the gel. That, that, that's me. <laughs> what would be the last show that you went to go see before the pandemic shut us down? The last show, uh, me and my wife, we have this um, connection to Mumford and Sons. Mm -hmm. When we got, uh, when we met, it was kind of this like uh, special band that has more meaning than the actual music. And they were actually uh, live in New York. So that was kind of a, a win-win because we, we got a couple of days off, just us two. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, right before the pandemic. We had the, the chance to go, to go uh, see those guys. Uh, how much of any vacation that you're going on is framed around breweries? Always, always. <laughs> Super important. <laughs> always. And your wife is on board? Yeah, yeah. We actually met in uh, a university, so she's, she's been uh, there since the beginning, and uh, she's been able to cope with it. And uh, often we, we have the kids around, so it's always a, a really fun time. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Uh, I want to talk about the creation of the beer that changed everything here. The haze. Where did this idea come from, and and how did you make it happen? Yeah, it, it's a pretty cool story because um, Boreal in uh, 2015. Uh, every time we need, we wanted to come up with a new product, it was always very complicated because it had to be commercialized, had to be put in a bottle. We didn't have we didn't even have the canning line yet. Then you have to put labels. You have to you know it was a big big thing, and we were just looking out for a way to be more. Uh, you know, innovative and just try a batch and not have to go through the whole process, right? So we came up with what we called Ipizad. So um, yes. it was a kind of a program. It was only on in kegs, only on draft. And it was uh, a new beer every two months, about a month and a half, two months. And we selected, um, it was about 15 or 20 bars across the province. So every, you know, Ipizad was a, uh, a kind of a West Coast IPA. And then we did a saison with uh, cucumbers and basil, which was pretty fun but it was a, a love or hate thing and um, <laughs> the fourth episode I, I really uh, I really wanted to brew this wheat wine which was wasn't really common and it was this beer that you know fermented out pretty well but it needed more time in the tank uh, and the deadline was coming pretty quick because all these bars know that knew that this fourth beer was coming out and the program was going pretty well and I, I always kept brewing in my garage trying new stuff and I'm like okay so we have to come out with this beer and it needs to be in the kegs in three weeks the wheat wine won't be ready. So what are we going to do? So I'm like, ah, I got this IP I've been working on. I think, you know, it's starting. We, we keep hearing about a, a lot of these new uh, New England breweries. And back in that day, I think the only uh, proper example was uh, Oval with their uh, Nordais. And mm. never am I going to say that our, our products was, was close to, <laughs> to Ben's products. And it's a guy that I, I really admire and uh, appreciate. But it, there wasn't really anything. I think a lot of brewers were trying it, but maybe it, it wasn't right there. So we just like, okay, let's try it. So we, we needed, a, we needed that beer out quick, uh, brewed in the first batch and uh, that's what we got. So it was uh, IP is not asked, which was only available in kegs. Uh, the reaction was, was way above our expectations. We never had that much of a, of a um, uh, people wanted more kegs and then we had no more. And like, what do we do? We'll, we'll, we'll brew it again. And then it was over and over. And we we're like, okay, this is probably gonna be the last batch. And it just, he kept on spreading and we're, we're just looking at each other like what the hell's going on it's just beer why are people going crazy for beer <laughs> and you know that was like five years back so it wasn't the whole hype thing where people were doing lineups and you know there was some lineups but it wasn't what it is today so we're just like what the hell is going on so uh so we keep on doing that and uh doing cakes i'm like okay we got our cannon line why don't we put this stuff in cans and we we're only doing the smaller cans so okay let's do it and then I brought up the idea with the, uh, the marketing team, like, let's do a can release. And they're like, okay, that's not going to work because it's Bagayal. Bagayal is a big brewery. It's not even microbrewery. Nah. 
So like, no, no, as long as, you know, it's pretty cool. We, we enjoy beer. It's not because we brew more that we're not, you know, I think there's smaller breweries out there that don't have the same, you know, drive and passion for beer. It's not because we're bigger that we, we don't have that. So like, okay, screw it. Let's just try it. So we did this release in cans. Uh, it was a Saturday. It was raining. We're like, okay, in no March one's going to show something. Up. No, it was in March. Yeah, it yeah. was cold as hell. It was cold as hell. And uh, I talked to Sebastian, our, our CEO, and, and we're just betting, okay, are there going to be 10 people or 12 people? And then we get in like half an hour early and there was this huge lineup and we we're just like, okay, something's going on. That's so so, cool. so that's really how it started. And for us, it was a big a big change. And um, I think the real good thing with that beer for Barreal is that it opened up our eyes to what we were able to do that we didn't need to overthink stuff before coming out with a new beer. And I think that brings us to where we are today, where we can, you know, uh, last year, I think we did 32 new products that were commercialized in cans, which is, was never seen before for Barreal. And, you know, we see how people want new products. And um, so that was kind of like the, the second wave of Barreal, the, the rebirth, if we want. It was amazing. So, it was, yeah, it so was we're, amazing. Uh, yeah, so we're still, we're still surprised. Well, not surprised, but we're still really happy to see that it's still going strong after all this time. And I mean, the quality of the beer in Quebec has just exploded not only the quality, but also the quality. Uh, you got guys doing sick beers like Bas Canada, Mezarem, Brewski, and, you know, I'm passing a bunch of guys, but the beer is just crazy for that style. And that's not even talking about other styles, right? So uh, it's cool that we were able to kind of like, you know, be up to date now and then just be able to, you know, have fun with new beers. So It's super exciting. And uh, I meant to say at the beginning, I was too excited to talk about my love of this beer. Um, when I started playing gigs downtown in Montreal back in mid 2000s, I remember playing at Sapphire Club, which was on Saint Laurent Street. It had the worst load in in the winter. It was the worst. These horrible metal stairs in the back of the the building. You had to carry up all your gear to get up into this very cool but tiny room. And then they give you the drink tickets which is basically your pay at that point, <laughs> which is okay at that time. Cause you, you know, it's like going to school. You got to learn how to play a gig properly and drink craft beer. Cause I would go and what, what beers were there? They had Boreal products and I would drink Boreal Blonde. That was my first exposure to a somewhat more craft beer outside of uh, the big market Molson. Cause it's more, Boreal has always still been craft because it's, it's, so much smaller, yet it's as huge. It's not on the scale of a Molson or a Labatt. So, so I've been always been very impressed. And then over the years, I, I would buy that mix mix pack and enjoy those. And then the the Artisan series came out, and that that started before this um, the 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 can releases started, right? They were almost at the same time, almost at the same time. But uh, at, at first, the Artisanal series was maybe two beers. Yeah, and then it, it, over the years, it kind of you know kind of grew. Yeah, so there was like the ISA, yeah. and uh, another one that I can't remember off the top of my head. But that that was when I was like, oh, something's going on here. They're understanding that that craft beer can be treated differently. So is it freeing to to not have to have flagship beers anymore? As much as it has become a flagship, this one now, yeah, but it's yeah. not not a part of the classic classic line of like Masorum that put out countless styles of Crazy. beers they have no limitations i sort of feel bad for mark andre and when i interviewed this i asked him i was like who has more trouble coming up with ideas you with a new beer or him coming up with a new label and he was like oh he it's him with the label because i have <laughs> i have ingredients to play with here and it's going to be a beer no matter what <laughs> yeah. so is it freeing for you now to to be stepping away from flagships uh yeah it's freeing in a way because you know as a brewer the the wow in that job is just, you know, creating new beers and not just creating for creating, but getting the chance to work with uh, new ingredients. Uh, there's always new ways of improving your beer and um, all that stuff. So it's really cool for that. But part of my job is also to make sure that those flagship, those classics uh, keep on being on par with the quality of, you know, how they were 30 years ago and how they were 10 years ago and all that. So, and they remain a big, the majority part of the beer we sell. So it's still really important. And as much as it's important to keep those beers, you know, rock solid in terms of quality, it's all part of the DNA of what is Barreal. And if we forget that, then there's no 
goal of going forward and just trying to do new stuff. We just have to take that base and just keep expanding it. So I see all these new beers are just like, you know, a bug out 2.0 where, you know, it's kind of more up to date with uh, what people want. People want new stuff. They want new experiences. So it's, it is more freeing to have that possibility just to have like that uh, white canvas and, you know, go have fun, do what you want. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. It must be freeing, but of course you have to keep the, the classic lineup in tip top shape because if there's a Boreal client that's been drinking this beer for the past 30 years, you can't go there and taste that beer and it not be that beer anymore because you're too busy thinking of some new beer for a hype drop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a beer that, that you wish that you could redo, that you could go back and got away from you? I know you guys have extreme, extreme quality control and you're not afraid to dump stuff if it's not up to par but is there a beer that has gotten out there that you wish you could have had more time with or uh yeah we um well, we have the Relais Boreal, which is right at the brewery where it's kind of a growler station if you want you just go in and um there we usually have uh pilot brews so we have a smaller pilot system where we can have fun and uh, try new stuff and um one of those beers, we actually uh, did a barrel aging in bourbon barrels. And some of those barrels really? were barrels that uh, we got from uh, Du Ciel. And it was our first experience. And the beer turned out pretty well. I mean, out of four, we kind of chose two. So, you know, we kind of chose exactly what we wanted. But uh, that was really fun. It was our first experience. And I think, you know, uh, that's something I, I want to work towards. Both uh, barrel aging of, you know, clean beers and just in... in uh, in barrels but also mixed fermentation and that's a big right now it's a big no-no because we don't want to mix it with our our clean beer no, no, no. but uh, uh you know i got some ideas of how we could do that on a separate level but still have fun and keep on experimenting so we had that beer which was really fun uh we also did some uh some sours little kettle sours but we're uh pretty fun also with uh, with fruit i mean when, when summer comes by it's always a big uh, a big hit and always fun to experiment with it, experiment with that so um the, the the IPAs, you know, it's fun, but once you've done uh, 20, 30 different beers, it's always fun to try <laughs> something new. And you're, you're always trying to get the most out of that beer. But then, you, you know, you step back, you're like, oh, that, that'd be cool just to, you know, to, to work with bread and then just work with, uh, you know, barrel fermented uh, saison and all that stuff. So, so yeah, yeah. I'd like that. <laughs> Hayes is definitely going to be, your 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 hit song your your if you were in nirvana it's your smells like teen <laughs> spirit even if you hate that fucking song you gotta play it every night so you're gonna have to keep brewing some haze sadly because everyone's gonna be looking for it yeah that's a, that's a good way of seeing it <laughs> <laughs> you guys are also one of the first people to do that you knew that this was something and i knew that it was something too but you were the first people to print on the bottom of the cans when yeah. the beer is good from yeah and, and that's that's a big debate we have now especially with our sales team because um from from the start all, all our products were uh and now you know Lara, which which uh one of the, the founders of Barreal, and she always fought against you know the big guys and uh one of her, her selling point was that uh because we're so confident in our beer and the quality of our beer instead of just putting some random number that no one is going to understand on the, on the bottle we'll go number? out front and tell you according to our quality standards this is when the beer is no longer, you know, good for consumption according to our standards. So it was right in your face that, you know, this is the day. So you have an idea of the freshness of your beer. So that's something we, you know, when I, I was, I was saying that we, it's really important to keep the DNA of the, the beer and just expand it. So when we have that beer, we know how, how fragile it is. And as soon as we started canning, we actually built this huge fridge in the, the warehouse just for that yeah, beer. So yeah. as soon as it comes out of the, uh, of the canning line, it goes right in the fridge. And then we're like, okay, so we, we did some tests and we're reading reviews or uh, of other breweries and uh, how long those kind of beers stay good for. And, you know, they usually range from six to eight weeks, even sometimes more. And we're like, okay, you know, screw it. Let's just go with four weeks to make sure that it's top quality. Now we're at five weeks because we did some tests and after 12 weeks, the beer is still really good if it's kept, it's being kept cold because we got this crazy good canning line that we just installed. So we're mm -hmm. really confident with the quality of the product. But yeah, it, it's just this thing that, you know, uh, we're confident of the quality of the product and uh, we want to be really transparent with the consumer. And so this that's why we have both dates. We have the canning date. So if people want to base on their liking, 
the freshness and we yeah. have for people that might not be as aware the best before date yeah yeah because people want to some, some people love that that super green yeah right away some people just they hunt that yeah for me the 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 nagas is is uh, at peak after three weeks I, I, then I'm again, pe- your camp too. Yeah. yeah. So, but I know people they they prefer it from the bright tank or uh, after eight weeks. But you know, I think that's the, the thing that's pretty cool. It's uh, everybody finds their their take. Like music, beer is subjective, right? Like music, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is that weird number that other breweries put? That's like an internal system that they have. The other numbers? Oh yeah, the other numbers normally um, for traceability reasons and quality reasons, you want the the lot number. Right, so in our case, uh, and I'm reading from from a Pilsner can, it's uh, you can have the the time, so that's always good if you you have a complaint from a consumer, mm. so you can go the, and then maybe between, you know, eight and nine there might be a problem according to your report, so then you can kind of troubleshoot, uh, but then you have the the lot number. So in our case, you know, C is for can, well obviously it's in a can, but sometimes you can have more than one line. Twenty is the year, and uh, then the numbers is based on a uh, a lot number. Okay. So in this case, 1466, we know exactly that it was brewed on this day by this brewer, fermented in that tank, uh-huh. filtered that day, and then canned by that this uh, crew. Super interesting. Yeah. That way, if anything's wrong, you can just know you you know exactly. Yeah, and that exactly. that's the that's the goal. We we do these practices uh, every three months where we uh, invent uh, a problem where we have to go grab our our product off the shelf. And then uh, everybody sits together and our goal is to be able to trace back to the last case uh, within two hours. Holy shit, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's not, it's not fun, but for us, it's really important to be able to, to give that, that service and that quality to the consumer. You have to, yeah. It's, you know, there's so Real much competition. There's so much competition. Out there. If they go and they pick up that can, you guys, you have a legacy, so, so they'll be more forgiving. But a new brewery that just puts out a subpar product and that client walks into that craft beer store, they say, this is the one I'm going to invest in right now. And they take it home. They'll never buy it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's just never. so many too. So it's not like before we had four breweries and you're like, eh, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just try it again. And they're like, okay, well, they're done. Next. I guess this is normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They'll get better. But uh, let's talk about how, what dies in an IPA? Why does it die? Why does it die? Um, I think I think there's a lot of reasons. Uh, the first, um, you know, it's saturated with hops, and hops is uh, the main the main aspect of the hop that, that's going to give the 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 wow factor to New England IPA is the oils, right? And oils, like any type of oil, it's very sensitive to oxidation. Mm-hmm. So as soon as you have some oxidation in your product, there's going to be an initial transformation, which might ha- actually help the beer. But then if you go a bit too far and that range is really tight, then you're just going to lose all that explosiveness from the hops, the fruity character and all that. And it's really also going to kind of change the mouthfeel and it's just going to die off real quick. Okay. So and that's I've, one I've of the... I've always seen the, the oxidation, whenever I see people saying that it's oxidized, the color of the beer is completely whack. Yeah, and I, when you get to that level, that's because there's a big quality problem somewhere probably the canning line there was an issue that the operator or the breed unfortunately didn't see but before you get to that level to a color change you're also going to notice you know the, the beer just kind of fades out kind of dies okay. so for me that that's one of the biggest issues then you have the temperature so uh like with anything the, the warmer something is the the faster the reactions are going to occur Mm. So that kind of that can increase the oxygen, uh, the oxidation of the beer, although your levels are are quite under control. So that could affect it also. And the other is going to be time because, uh, you know, the hazy IPA. So it's in the name you, you want. You want haze because it's kind of that, that saturation, which is uh, homogeneous across, you know, your glass. Yeah, so yeah. with time, you know, gravity does its job and you can't do anything against it. It's just going to kind of settle out. And if it settles out, then it's less in your face when you go to drink it. So I'd say those could be the main three uh, factors that could explain why these beers are so fragile and tend to die off. Excellent. See, I, I, I know that it did, but I, I needed an expert to tell me <laughs> why. <laughs> Let's talk about Collabs. You talked a lot about it. You guys, uh, we're drinking one right now with uh, Masaram, killer, killer, killer brew. You guys did one with 
my boys, Sir John, Joanna and Max are amazing. Vox and Hops alumni, I love them. Uh, I discovered them very early when they started distributing in Montreal and I was very lucky for that. Love, love their beers. Um, if you could do a collab with anyone, who would that be? Anyone, anyone. Like in the province or anyone? No, we could do both. Let's, let's, you know, I got uh, listeners from all over the globe, so. Yeah, I think uh, it, it, it was one of the breweries that really fascinated me. And when I visited the brewery, my jaw just like dropped. Literally, I was just mesmerized. I felt like a little kid in this Toys R Us for the first time is uh, Sierra Nevada. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and uh, I find their, their story from the Gago is so fascinating. And when I visited their new brewery in, um, it was in North Carolina, uh, it's just spectacular and how they, they are still using, you know, whole hops and the whole philosophy behind that. I just, I would love to brew with them with, you know, their technique and uh, their mindset, just like this, you know, really simple pale ale, West Coast pale ale. I, I'd be like really, really stoked about that. Uh, the other brewery in the States, which I, I, I'm a huge fan of is uh, Schilling in yeah. New Hampshire and they they are just killing it on everything. You know, they're, they're, they're sours, they're hazy IPAs, but their uh, lagers are just, I don't, I don't know any breweries within, I don't know what radius that are hitting lagers like they are. It's just, it's just crazy. Them and Illegal. <laughs> but oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing an excellent job on everything they touch, so. That's super dope, super dope. Sierra Nevada, my first craft beer. Oh, One yeah. of my first craft beers, 2008 on tour with Cryptopsy. I remember the day. <laughs> <laughs> Pale ale. It's still delicious. It's still delicious. Killer, oh, yeah. killer beer. Yeah. And I think I think West Coasts are coming back this year. We'll, we'll yeah. see. West we'll Coasts see are a, awesome. We'll see a big resurgence of that, I think so. As much as people want the haze, they want something with a dank bite, uh, like a nice uh, piney bite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's coming back. Let's talk about freedom. You, you work for a, a huge, huge company. So, so now, now you have a bit more freedom and, and choice to, to do strange things with the new adventures, uh, all the collabs that are coming out, all the, the, the beers that you released this year. Um, how much freedom do you have because it is such a huge monster? Like I can just call my friend at most of these breweries in Montreal and say, let's do a collab. And they're like, okay, come by. In two weeks, we're going to brew it. And I'm like, okay, do you have that freedom, basically, is where I'm going at. Uh, yeah, honestly, uh, since the beginning, I think uh, Barat has, has given me a lot of freedom, especially at the beginning when, uh, you know, I hadn't yet proved my, myself. And I think uh, the more the years go on, I think, uh, you know, I get all the freedom I want, honestly. Um, where it might get a bit more complica complicated, if I use the example you gave, you know, we often get those demands. Hey, we're a local bike shop. You want to do a collab? And we're like, fuck yeah, man, that sounds awesome. But are you ready to, can you sell 2000 cases of beer? Jesus, yeah. Or like, <laughs> maybe not. So I think in terms of freedom, the mindset is there. But because, you know, you said, uh, you know, we're a big brewery. We're, we're maybe one one hundredth of what is most in Labatt. We're, we're still crazy small compared to them, but we're, you know, we're bigger compared to, you know, the, your local pub. But in order to make things work, you need to sell a certain quantity. Mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes, you know, these small spontaneous projects uh, might get a bit more complicated. But oftentimes we, we, we find out a way because, you know, working with, I'm using the, the bike shop analogy because we got that demand last week and, you know, these guys are awesome and we're, we love biking and we just, we're just going to find a way to make it work. Although financially it might not be the best decision. <laughs> uh, you know, if something gets us excited, we'll find a way around it. So in terms of freedom, um, yeah, I get a lot of freedom and uh, that's why I'm still about that, honestly. That's Amazing. one of the big reasons. Yeah. That's a good decision on their part. You could just rebrand, <laughs> just rebrand a beer for the bike shop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just make print a few labels for them. And <laughs> tell them to pick something that's already made. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's wrap this up with a classic Vox and Pops wrap up question. Um, it probably never happens to you because, like me, you're a father of young children and you got to wake up early to brew beer every day. But uh, every once in a while, it happens to everyone, especially when you're drinking a. You got a taste test, you know, these 8.6% delicious brews here. Uh, what is your hangover cure? Wow, that's a good one. 
you know what? The best hangover cure, it, it takes all the energy and willpower you have, but you know, you go for a run or a bike ride and then you go for a cold shower. And I think that's, that's the best, but you know, it always depends on your, your hangover level. Cause when you're a nine on 10, <laughs> that might not be possible, but I, I think that's really the best just to kick your butt and just kind of a seize your body. It kind of works. I love it. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much for taking the time talking to me about your life, about craft beer, a little bit about metal. I, I truly, truly appreciate it. And a uh, huge fan. Super honored that we had the chance to have a chat. Cheers. Thanks a lot for the invite. Cheers, man. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, was I ever stoked for this chat. I, You can obviously tell how much of a fan I am of what Gabrielle has brought to the Quebec craft beer scene. I, I just kept gushing my, my praise and adoration. And it's true. And I still go back and I still buy those brews. I still buy... The IP is no less frequently. It's a killer, killer brew that is available everywhere. And that is something I think is very special. Thank you, Gabrielle, for taking the time to have a chat with me. I'm super stoked that we got the chance to connect. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened throughout the past week in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, such as all the information for any episodes which I dropped throughout that past week, if I've been a guest on someone else's podcast, any information for any cool projects I have in the works, such as Brutal North America, as well as the updated links to Thirsty Thursday Virtual Hangs and the links to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify and is curated by my man, Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself. So please do me a favor, sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list because there's just so much going on in the world of Vox and Hops. I would hate for you to miss a single thing. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I hope you have a glorious weekend. I am looking forward to resting a little bit because everything has been just crazy. I need some R&R and I hope that you guys get the same. I will be back next week with two episodes, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops hits. Oh,